Hi, and welcome to today's topic on the Kinetics platform in Flojo V10. My name is Jack Panopoulos. I'm an application scientist for Flojo, and, uh, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of BD. And as I mentioned today, we're going to be talking about the Kinetics platform. This can be uh, found underneath the Tools tab in the Biology band. You can see here the Kinetics platform is sort of tucked away underneath the Cell Cycle platform just above it. The Kinetics platform is a useful platform whenever we're doing calcium influx studies. That is, we want to monitor whether or not there is free or bound calcium, and we are using a dye that changes its emission spectrum as a result of having bound dye or free dye. So um, in order to invoke the tool, as I mentioned, you probably want to select a sample that has been stimulated. So I have a gated workspace here. And I'm going to go ahead and invoke the platform. This happens to be a stimulated sample. This makes it easy to create these time slice gates. So in these types of experiments, we're going to be looking to see, number one, do we have um, stimulation occurring as a result of adding that agonist to the cells? If stimulation does occur, we should see a change in the emission spectra of one dye versus the other. And that is what is being shown on the y-axis here. So the y-axis generally is going to show a ratiometric parameter between two dyes. So in this case, it is the ratiometric parameter between DAPI and INDO1. So the detector for, this, uh, for, these two, um, for these two dyes essentially has been divided one via the other. Now, if you do not happen to have the ratiometric parameter, but you know that you need to divide DAPI by INDO1, you can actually artificially create this in Flojo itself by using the derived parameter platform. So you select the sample that you want to create, go ahead and uh, to the Tools tab here, go to the Cytometry band, find derived parameters. You can call this uh, your own name, so ratio DAPI to INDO, whatever the case may be, and you go ahead and tell it which parameters you want to divide by. So in my case, I might go take DAPI and divide it by INDO. And then you can change the scaling here if you'd like. Generally speaking, when you have a ratio metric parameter, linear scale is just fine. Uh, you can also transform it if you happen to convert it to any of the other uh, types of scales, but in general we probably leave this as linear and then go about our business. Okay, now when you go to your graph window you'll actually see that it's appended with this new derived ratiometric uh, parameter as uh, in, uh, added to the list. Okay, But in the case of the kinetics platform, so that's just a way of artificially creating one if it's not already there. Okay, So the y-axis is going to be the ratio, right? Uh, essentially the emission uh, ratio between DAPI and INDO in this experiment, but it can be any two, uh, any two emission lines uh, that you wish to compare. And then the x-axis here is time. So what we want to do initially when we come into this uh, window is we want to draw some time slices. Now Flojo has several options here at the top. You can manually create your own time slices by simply using the range gate at the top. You can also use this auto generator for you. This one will create the same sized time slices, uh, but it will uh, gen and it will generate as many as you want. So you can essentially get, you know, six or seven histogram gates if that's what you would like. Uh, you can also use the auto function here, and this one will try to create time slice gates based on where Flojo sees an inflection point. So we can maybe start with that one and if we have to make any adjustments we can go ahead and add it. So we'll go ahead and click the auto option and in Flojo's case it apparently sees only three areas of inflection and I don't know about you but visually I see several different areas so we'll create a few more gates here momentarily. But let's begin by chopping up the data into the different regions that we see. So generally in these types of experiments we're going to have some section where there's a baseline. Right, baseline acquisition before we actually hit the cells with the agonist, we want to see what the ratio is between those two parameters. Where does it start? Then once we hit the cells with the agonist, there usually is going to be a change that occurs, and that change can be quite rapid. So this is the 
inflection point here that we want to monitor. We see that we go from this baseline up to some higher, um, some higher point, and then after, once we reach this apex, a lot of times you'll see either a, a downward slope here, or sometimes it'll plateau across the top. Um, generally speaking, this time slice is going to be a little bit more narrow. We just want to monitor that stimulus phase, and then the third gate that we would place uh, might be to monitor that uh, that refractory period or the time when the you know cells are essentially um, uh, re-sequestering that calcium. If you want, you can re-monitor. It looks like we've got two stim phases here. So we could actually uh, monitor the re-stim as well. So I'll go ahead and just, you know, create my own secondary uh, sets of time gates here. So this one, I'll leave it as range four. That's fine as a name. And then we'll just move it over so we make sure that we're looking at cells and not the gap. And then we'll create another one for the second refractory period. We'll call that range five. That's fine. Okay, so you might have something that looks like this that monitors all phases. But in general, most experiments are going to have this baseline, the inflection point, and then a refractory period. This is a little bit more rare where you have a dual stimulation uh, uh, occurring. But in any case, once you have the uh, once you have the time slices set up, you can go ahead and apply this kinetics node if you want to the rest of the samples in the group. So in my case, what I can do here is I can simply right click and say copy analysis to group, or I can drag the kinetics node underneath the gate of the sample that I want to go after. So in my case, I'm just going to use that right click menu, send it off to all the other samples. All right, once you've copied everything over to the rest of the group, you actually begin investigating the statistics that this platform outputs for each one of your samples. So let's get into the menus here for each one of the options that we have. So the first menu that we have is an option drop-down menu. This will allow you to change the visualization of the graph that you see above so that you can convert it to Instead of looking at the median of the y-axis here, again, the median of the, uh, the ratio metric parameter, you can change this to mean. You can also change it to geo mean. You can also set a threshold if you would like. So you can do this via percentage or via fixed value for the median, in which case you could, you could ignore cells that, let's say, fall below a certain value on the y-axis and only pay attention to the stuff that is above it. In general, we probably want to stick with the median here, and uh, you also have the option to go ahead and uh, smooth this so that you can look at a Gaussian or a moving average. Now, Gaussian generally smooths, uh, it goes every three bins, and it essentially weights each of those three bins equally. Uh, the moving average, on the other hand, will weight the middle bin of those three bins a little bit heavier. So there's a difference in how they look, but in general, a little bit of smoothing is kind of nice. It just uh, gets rid of the scratchy lines there for you, and it doesn't significantly impact the statistics that you have down below. So I'd go ahead and give this a Gauss. If you make a change to the Kinetics platform, you may want to apply it so that all other samples get that particular change. So now everything is going to appear smooth. Oh, and I should mention when you do when you want to set the threshold, pick one of the threshold options here, and this will give you a menu that allows you to pick an absolute value or to use a percentile of cells that are in a particular time slice for you. So again, it's up to you if you want to define a threshold or not, but this is the menu that will allow you to do that. And then of course, if you need to reset the threshold or come up with a new one, this button then becomes invocable and you can change the values. Okay, in our case, again, we've made all of our time slices for the different sections. Now, if we want to investigate some of the statistics that are associated with those sections, I'm going to go ahead and collapse this menu and kind of extend this one down a little bit so that we can try to see everything here all in one go. Okay, so, the stats table down below gives you some uh, statistics that are related particularly to time and also uh, the slope of some of these uh, lines as well as the area under the curve. So the first two statistics, the start time, start T and end T, uh, these are just uh, the start time and end time of each one of the time slices. So the auto-generated time slice 
the first one, the red one here, it starts at time 4 and then ends at time 57. And if we compare that to a much larger time slice, like the pink one at the end, that is called range number 5. You can see here 557 and it ends at 955. And there's a 400 second gap or a 400 time unit gap uh, versus, say, a 40 to 50 time unit gap here in auto slice number 1. So not super useful for uh, comparisons, it just lets you know what uh, the start and end is. The peak T, this is just telling you the time where the peak value was uh, seen for that, tr for that particular line trace. This is probably easiest to experience when you look at the time slice. It has an inflection point. You see it has a high point somewhere around um, this area. And uh, according to the stats menu here, that is right around the time of uh, 110. So that time slice stretches from 73 to 151, but the peak value was experienced at 110. Uh, the peak value, the, the actual number, the, mod, uh, the modal number or the peak value that is achieved here, it's telling you what it, what it gets essentially on the y-axis there, was around 354. The average, and then of course the slope. So the slope is a really important one. A steep slope, right? High slope generally in, means that you've got a strong stimulation, right? Something has happened. If you have a negative slope or a zero slope or the values are really low, then generally speaking, you probably don't have any stimulation of your cells. But a slope here of 1.97 is pretty steep. So we know the cells have been stimmed. If we actually look at the green slice here, range number four, this also has a high slope, right? 2.16. And you might even say that that second stim was a bit stronger than the first one. Okay, then the refractory periods in our case here, they're going to have a negative slope. We're heading back down the mountain, um, and you can kind of compare those two. Obviously, the more negative it is, the more quickly, I guess, the cells are heading back towards the baseline. If it's a little bit broader, again, closer to zero, it's going to take it uh, a bit, have a bit longer of a uh, refractory period. AUC, AUC stands for area under the curve, so this kind of gives you an idea of uh, the magnitude or at least the number of cells that uh, you're looking at, right, or not number of cells, but sort of it's the duration of that, uh, of that particular period. So both the slope and the AUC are probably the most useful statistics in this model. And then uh, the DT here, this just stands for the delta time, so this subtracts uh, the end time versus the start time and tells you how many seconds total each time slice was. Obviously, if you have a larger time slice, you're going to have a larger AUC. So you just need to take into account all of, these, all of this information. Okay, once you have your model set up, you may want to rotate to some of the other samples here. Just make sure that your gates are kind of set in the right spots. So sometimes Sloger does a good job to do this automatically for us, but Again, here I'm going to say this is probably the refractory period. These cells or this sample, for whatever reason, was took a really long time to reach that maximum peak value. Let's say it's somewhere around there. And then we go ahead and adjust this. All right, so on and so forth. This is probably still being stimmed, but we'll leave it alone uh, for the time being. All right, so on and so forth. As you roll through your samples, just make sure that you adjust these gates appropriately for the respective samples. And then once you've adjusted all of the gates, you can now look at compiling all this information in either the layout or the table editor. So if we open up the layout editor, we're going to be able to look at visualizations of these kinetics plots. Right, drag in your base sample if you want. You get all the statistics here in that, uh, that were in that lower table in the graph window or the platform. They're all included here. You, of course, can ungroup this and remove the time slices that you're not interested in. You can batch this. Right? We can create an output that shows us the report for all of the time slices across all samples. But perhaps more important is you can actually make comparisons here between two samples as an overlay uh, by using the um, a drag and drop function in the layout editor. So here I can compare sample 1 versus sample 2, look at their, uh, the activation of one versus the other. We obviously, in the blue sample here, we seem to have kind of a slow stim. 
uh, in the beginning doesn't really reach the same peak that that first red sample did, uh, but the second stem on the blue sample seems to take, there's an initial ramp up and then it seems to still increase. It doesn't reach a refractory period very uh, quickly, whereas the, the red sample does. So it's a very good visual uh, comparison of what's happening with those cells. And uh, of course you can look at the statistics for all of these guys and make comparisons there by using the table editor. So if you open up the table editor tab, we can go ahead and drag in the kinetics node here and get rid of any extraneous information. A lot of times we don't want to look at, you know, the delta time, for example. It's probably not a super uh, useful statistic for us, or at least the start and end times, uh, same thing. I probably would only look at the slope and area under the curve for uh, these samples. So we got slope area the, under the curve, and then I probably do this for all the remaining samples here. Just remove all the extraneous, uh, remove all that extraneous information. In any case, to save a little bit of time here, you guys get the idea, but it's doing this for each one of the time slices that we have. Okay, but from there, if you want, you can go ahead and heat map your statistics if you'd like, and then go ahead and cog this, batch it, and you get your nice little heat map table. In my case, I'm only heat mapping them for the first couple of time slices. Um, but you can apply this, of course, to all the time slices and get a nice visualization here. Okay, you can copy paste that to Excel if you'd like. Go to the table editor tab uh, as an alternative. Change the display to to file and then go ahead and export this as a CSV or an Excel file. And that concludes our kinetics workshop for today. Uh, please let us know if you have any questions and thank you for joining.